Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. But how's it going today? Happy as I can be. How are you today? Good, thanks. Yeah, so um, really interesting talk coming up today. Yes, we do. We have uh, uh, one of the interesting guys in at Root & Riddle, Dr. Charlie Scoggin, Colorado guy, does reproduction, and he's going to come in here and talk to us about um, some advanced techniques that they're doing with uh, ICSI. He'll explain all that, what it means. I'm excited to have him. Yeah, this will be a good talk. Um, Charlie's um, come to us, and uh, you know he did a lot of ambulatory practice for a start, and he actually uh, was a resident veterinarian on a farm for a while, yep. and he's come to the practice, and he's sort of picked up and run with the ball on some of the assisted reproductive techniques, and uh, yeah, ICSI, intercytoplasmic sperm injection, um, that's actually right at the cutting edge, and so we're really uh, lucky to have Charlie uh, pick this up and run with it and have an interest in it, and I think it's going to really add the value to the services we can provide our clients. Absolutely, and you mentioned Charlie was a resident veteran, so he did a little bit of everything. Yep. He's gotten laser-focused now, and he's yeah. like a bulldog on a bone with this advanced <laughs> reproductive stuff, and uh, having having him in our practice, is, he's, he's a treasure, and um, he does a great job, and uh, I'm looking forward to having him. Yeah, should be a good talk. Okay, let's bring him in. So coming up next, we've got Dr. Charlie Scott to talk about XC and other advanced reproductive technologies. Charlie, welcome to Stallside. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Looking forward to it. Yeah. So tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, well, I, I grew up in Boulder, Colorado. I uh, actually was born in North Carolina, but only spent just a real short period of time there. Um, my, my mom and dad are originally from out, out west, and I um, um, Really, it was a, a great place to grow up, a college town, um, somewhat liberal in terms of their overall attitude, but uh, I learned and got to experience just a, a wide range of experiences and opportunities out there. Um, probably the biggest thing uh, that, I, that I cherished most was the mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, they were just an endless supply of, of, of entertainment and, and fun, regardless of the season, from fishing, hunting, snowboarding, um, gathering cattle. Um, it was great. And, um, you know, there was also horse uh, mountains that, that brought me to love horses. We'd go gather cattle, primarily some bulls, or um, go out in the plains and, and do some brandings. Um, mom and dad, uh, they they had their own jobs, but they liked to, to do a little bit of rodeo in themselves. I mean, nothing serious, don't yeah. get me wrong. Um, but my dad liked to team rope. My mom mm -hmm. was a, a barrel racer, and I just tag along with them. And really, the only way I could ever go with my dad, and he'd go three or four times a week, and it was serious, but I'd always have to take a nap from about, you know, noon to two. And if I did that, I always got to tag along with them. And and to this day, when noon to two hits. I was going to say, I've, <laughs> I've caught you sometimes in your truck around then. Yeah. That so, habit stuck. Uh, but after two o'clock, I'm, I'm good to go now. Okay. That, so. That's good. Did you do any of the rodeo stuff yourself? I, I did a little bit. A lot of the Jim Conning stuff. So, um, you know, some, some barrel racing, pole bending, um, tie the bow on the, on the goat's tail. Yeah. You know, that, that type of stuff. And, and, I, and I did a little bit of team roping. Uh, matter of fact, the, the first vet that I ever worked for, and, and really my, my first veterinary mentor, he was a really good team roper. Um, name was Dr. Fitch. Um, and uh, we, he, he typically didn't work on Wednesdays, and, but I'd still work for him. Um, in the mornings, I'd do stuff like fix fence, mow, you know, do all that. And then sometimes in the afternoon, he'd, he'd have me go round up his cattle because he kept a, a decent-sized herd of Corrienti and he had both an indoor and an outdoor roping arena. Mm. And uh, we'd tool around. I was no count, really. Um, but uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. So, and, uh, so I... You know, I haven't I haven't roped a steer probably since I was since 1999. Um, yeah. But I still I still watch it when I get the chance, and um, I still get on the Spin to Win website every once in a while. Mm, good. Sounds like a great way to grow up. Yeah, That's absolutely. Good. Sounds like fun. So um, you said horses got you into veterinary medicine. Um, tell us a little bit about your education and what brought you to Root and Riddle. Uh, I, I went to. Uh, I actually went to graduate school and vet school at Colorado State University. Didn't get into vet school the first time I applied. It was a year out of college. Um, you know, I got decent grades, um, and but I 
I, I just thought, uh, and I, but I got really good ACT scores, or excuse me, GRE scores, and I thought that was going to put me over the top, but um, didn't get in, went and sat down for an interview, and they said, you just got to make your, your resume or your, your application better. You know, you got all this horse experience, um, but, you know, what about cattle? What about dogs? And so um, that really spurred me to, to look into some other um, areas of interest, but I went back to the horse. I got accepted into a master's program at CSU's equine reproduction program. Um, got my master's in equine reproductive physiology under Ed Squires, Pat McHugh, and Elaine Carnavalli. And um, yeah, and, and it's really that that was that experience is, is really what has projected me um, to today to who I am. No, that, and that's and that's an incredible group of oh, people, yeah. right? And, and, and inspiring too. I, I can see why you ended up where you're at, having worked with them. Yeah, and I mean, it's no coincidence. I, I developed a f- relative fondness for, for oocytes because of Dr. Carnavalli. I mean, Elaine was, <clears throat> um, she was on the forefront of that stuff mm-hmm. back in the late 90s and early 2000s, doing um, a gift and, and oocyte transfer. And I got to be around her and help her out with that. And um, it was, it was um, a great experience and just saw how serious she took it, too. I mean, it, it wasn't just, oh, you know, it's a horse, we're going to do this and that. No, I mean, it was like we were in a human IVF clinic and everything was, was meticulous from record keeping to how we handled the instruments. And um, again, that's projected forward mm-hmm. to this day to yeah. me. Yeah. So what would you like to tell us about today? Well, what I'd really like to talk about is in vitro fertilization and, um, and especially how it applies to horses. Um, as I think I mentioned uh, to you earlier when we were just chatting here, there's really only one technique, um, in vitro technique, that really applies to horses right now. It's called uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And that's a, a method whereby we take a single egg and a single sperm and inject it. Um, but let me back up real quick, um, because when we say in vitro fertilization, that's actually a fairly large or encompasses several other techniques aside, aside from ICSI. Um, one other technique is, is the actual or true in vitro fertilization, an example of which is on the screen um, right now. Uh, I believe this is an example of um, a human oocyte undergoing in vitro fertilization. And that process really is as simple as mixing eggs uh, with sperm in a, in a Petri dish and coming back a couple hours or a day later and seeing um, if any of those have become fertilized. Um, you know, this, this process seems to work okay in, in, in both uh, uh, humans and cattle, but for horses, we just we haven't been able to to get it to work. Well, I, I shouldn't say we haven't been able to. There's been some studies saying that they've got it done, but the ability to replicate um, these results is is eluded us. I kind of equi- um, uh, equilibrate it, not equilibrate, but it's it's equal to um, cold fusion. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of those things people say they've done, but when you try to replicate it, you just you can't do it. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that, um, or at least we think, why, why we cannot replicate those results. Uh, primarily, it's the physiology and the anatomy of the, of the uh, equine oocyte and the sperm cell. That, that oocyte has a fairly thick outer, outer zonary region. I'm going to skip to a, a picture here real quick to, to, to kind of give you an example um, of, of that. Uh, here, uh, this, the zona pellucida, uh, which is this thick outer capsule there, that's, that's awfully thick. And um, the ability of an equine sperm just to penetrate it on its own in a petri dish just doesn't happen. So we have to use other methods to make that happen. Um, and one of which I have an example uh, shown here. Uh, and that is uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And again, that's where we've taken a single sperm uh, and injected it into an egg and withdraw that pipette quickly. And then we end up culturing uh, those eggs or what we call presumptive zygotes uh, for a minimum of four days uh, to see if they've cleaved and then uh, developed into uh, developing embryos, which we can then um, culture further on to allow them to become transferable. Okay, so what would be the indications for this technique? Yeah, could you could you back give us give our maybe our listeners? <laughs> okay, because I'm sure there's some people listening going, this is you know we're getting complex here real quick. What do you need to do this for? Yeah, you know I should have apologized to you guys from the outset because when you start talking to me about this procedure, I can go, and I, mean, <laughs> I can go and go and go. Yeah. 
um, you know, one of the great things about being here at Root and Riddle is the opportunity y'all have given me to explore and, and, and to not, not, and not just explore, but develop this stuff. And no, I, and you I have, get excited about it. You have grabbed onto it. it. And, and <laughs> we, we, we laid him off his chain and he just <laughs> ran. So I'm, I'm sorry about that. No, no, yeah. no, it's, it's, it's okay. Just, just if you could just back up and go, mm-hmm. why, why, why in the horse do world do we, do we need yeah. to do this? Because, uh, you know, anyway, I'll, okay. I'll go ahead and take it from there. Right. Well, I guess I should start out by saying this this is not a permissible technique to use in thoroughbreds. Mm-hmm. This is obviously considered part of an advanced or assisted reproductive technique, so not permissible there. But for our other breeds, especially, say, our, our saddlebreds, um, our quarter horses, um, where uh, these advanced techniques are, are used, um, the, the indications for these are, are actually several. One, you have an, an old mare whose uterus is basically degenerated to the point where um, she can no longer carry a pregnancy pregnancy to term, um, uh, you know, or even uh, carry pregnancy for seven to eight days to do an embryo flush. She could just have so much pathology going on in her uterus that it's, it's an it's a, um, a, a impossible endeavor to flush an embryo. Um, so what this technique allows us to do is bypass the uterus uh, and collect the oocytes. So if you have uterine pathology or cervical pathology or some, something like that, that's another indication, or that would be one indication. Um, Another indication would be you're working with semen that is in limited supply or from a stallion that is deceased. Uh, I forget what the current record is in equine, um, ICSI, how old of frozen semen has been used since the horse was deceased. But yes, I mean, it, this technique requires only a small amount of sperm. And so if you have frozen semen from the 70s or, or 80s, um, that, that still should be viable and good enough to utilize uh, to fertilize eggs that you collect from, from mares today. Um, so again, working with semen in, in, in limited supplies. Um, and then the third one, and one that we've I would say are, are starting to see more and more of is the fact that this doesn't require near as much management as some of the as some of the other reproductive procedures does. Or if, if we're going to go out and breed a thoroughbred mare, you know they, they need us out there to check the mare to see if she's in heat, make sure she's got a clean culture, is she ready to go to the shed tomorrow? Then the day or two later, we have to come back out, confirm if she's been ovulate, if she's ovulated, run any treatment, so on and so forth. Same thing if we're doing embryo transfer or breeding a mare with AI, we have to monitor these mares along in their cycle. With this technique, we can basically collect eggs at any point during the cycle, uh, you know, regardless of where they're at or regardless if they're even cycling. So right now, here in December, January, you know, we're, we still, we're still aspirating um, oocytes uh, because mares are still developing follicles on their oocytes, or on their ovaries, excuse me. As long as you have a follicle about five millimeters or greater, we'll go after it and hopefully get it. Yeah, so, so but one of the huge advantages is for horses that are still performing, right? Exactly. It's, so there's advantages even over embryo transfer mm-hmm. because of this convenience factor. We don't have to manage them quite as long. And if I could just add one thing is the reason why it's become so convenient is this procedure can be done once every 10 to 14 days, and there's no care needed in in between. Um, As long as the procedure is performed, um, you know, safely um, and and done by by a professional, uh, you know, knock on wood, I won't do that for the noise, but, um, you know, we experience minimal complications. Um, You mentioned about small numbers or like um, limited supply of um, some semen for some stallions back from the 70s and 80s. Are there any particular like male reproductive problems where these techniques can actually help? Uh, Well, I I do believe um, that that intracytoplasmic sperm injection, um, again, where we take a single sperm and Mm -hmm. inject it into an egg, is the treatment of choice um, for for unexplained infertility in the in the man in the man in male, um, their 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 sperm might swim, but for some reason they they just cannot um, uh, you know cr- generate a pregnancy. So that's that's certainly you know one condition um, that it can be utilized for um, preservation um, of valuable genetics. Um, that's that's a big one. Uh, but you know the one thing and this the one limitation we currently have with with this with these procedures is we're not very 
capable of, of freezing eggs, um, equine eggs. You can okay. freeze women's eggs, mm-hmm. um, I, and I believe bovine eggs as well. But when it comes to, to horses, um, again, there's there's been reports of doing it, um, but successfully, um, and the ability to do it on a clinical or a commercial level, still not there. So what that forces you to do, um, and I, I, you know, here's another great example, is you have a valuable mare, and unfortunately, um, uh, she she succumbs to an acute illness, an acute death. Um, as long as she's not a thoroughbred, we can remove her ovaries, scrape the follicles, and then collect those oocytes, fertilize them, grow them to become embryos, and then freeze them to be transferred at a later time. From going back to what I just said, unfortunately, we cannot freeze those eggs. But you can freeze the embryos. But you yeah, can freeze, freeze, the the embryos. freeze the embryos. The problem with that, though, is that some these are often emotional times when the mare passes away, and they have to make a decision right away who they're going to use to fertilize those those um, oocytes with. Yeah, right. If we had a, a, a means to to properly freeze oocytes, we would be able to you know bypass some of those emotional decisions and even preserve mare's genetics, you know, years on down the line. Um, just just by keeping their own genetic material without it being fertilized. Just okay, yet. so that's a good, that's a good point. So, you know, it, it's helpful if people have thought about this. Usually, they they haven't. You yeah. know, so th- th- those situations do come up where mm-hmm. you want to harvest ovaries, but it's it's like you said, it's an emotional time, and it's um, you're up against the wall with things, and they haven't th- things they haven't thought through. So yeah, right. So um, talk us through talk us through the technique. Okay. All right. Well, I, I'm, I'm actually, I think, prepared um, with, with some slides here for, for this. Um, and uh, really, the first technique is the collection or, or, or uh, oocyte harvesting process. People use different terms, transvaginal aspirations or TVA. Other people call it OPU for ovum pickup. Okay. We, we typically say TVA. Um, shown in the, in the picture on the left there is, is um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Brady Camp, and, and her technician, um, Isabel, performing a, a transvaginal um, aspiration. And this involves placing a, a rather long probe um, with a, a large and long needle, a 12-gauge needle, intravaginally. And then with the other arm, uh, we go in rectally, position the, um, the ovary onto the probe, and then um, puncture each follicle. And equine ovaries, equine follicles, oocytes are different than a lot of their species in that they're oftentimes tightly tethered or adhered to the follicular wall. And so as a result, not only do we have to suck out the contents, but we flush fluid in, and we do that about 8 to 12 times to create as much turbulence as possible to dislodge that egg. Other species like cattle and, and, and women, they don't have to do any of that flushing. They just go in and just suck it out. And um, it's a much, as a result, it's a little bit more of an efficient process. Gotcha. Um, and then once we uh, complete with that, or excuse me, once we uh, finish with that process, we then filter them and, and look for the eggs. And, and shown in the slide on the right are some images of what I would consider mostly good quality equinocytes. What's, what's a successful session of, of collection? How many, how many do you anticipate getting? At least 50% um, of the number of follicles that we puncture. So I guess a little bit easier way of saying that for every two follicles we puncture, we expect to get at least one egg. Um, actually, if we, we keep stats on everything because we're just a little bit competitive in our lab. And our, our, our oocyte aspiration recovery rate right now is just under 60%. Um, so we do, we do pretty darn good. So if a mare's got 12 follicles, we hope to get at least six. And is that a good number, like per session, is that a pretty typical number that you'd get six, or is that, is that high or low? Well, it depends upon season yep. a little bit, um, but it, that, that'd be a little bit low. You know, our, our lab average is somewhere between seven and nine okay. oocytes per aspiration, um, depending upon the season. Uh, and that's pretty, I think, average for most other, most other labs. Okay. So, um, but once we, we harvest those, we then actually let them, let them sit overnight um, at, at room temperature. Um, studies have shown that this, this holding process uh, has no harm or really is of a no detriment to these oocytes and actually might help out with the, the maturation process. And that's what happens the next day. So we get in the lab early the next morning. Uh, we have our pre-equilibrated um, IVM or in vitro maturation plates, uh, and then we plop all the, the oocytes in, inside the, the wells there, and we let them uh, put them back in the CO2 incubator and let them sit for about 30 hours. And um, if oocytes are going to mature, 
at least equine oocytes, they should mature by then. Um, after that time, we then remove all those um, cells. You can see there's some extraneous cells um, surrounding these, uh, the, these oocytes, it's called stripping. Um, and then we look for a polar body, that's, which is um, shown in this image on the right, and I'm kind of uh, circling that right now, um, called the polar body there. And if they have one, we go ahead and do the injection process. And sh the injection process first requires um, the capture of a sperm cell, which demonstrating there. You can see there's sperm cells that uh, swim up and down the screen. Uh, we isolate one, put a nice little kink in their tail, because what that kink does is it disrupts the, the sperm membrane um, and, and activates it to, for fertilization. Um, we'll then suck up that, that sperm um, shown here, hopefully. Um, you can see they can get, we have to straighten them out a little bit because studies have shown you got to inject them head first versus tail first, at least uh, from what we know in horses. And then once we got that done, we then move to our next drop where there's an oocyte. And is it, is it harder sure. than catching a grease pig? <laughs> <laughs> Catch, catching a sperm, putting the kink in his tail. I oh. mean, there's, there's a country song about this somewhere. Yeah. 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 I don't know what country station you're listening to. <laughs> all I can say is that all those times you got yelled at for playing video games in your mother's basement, you can sort of say now, but look at the skills I exactly. gained. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, now that's, that's what it is. You can equate it somewhat to playing a video game. But I mean, the, talking about this procedure, it looks cool, at least, at least to geeks like me. And, you know, I can talk a big game, um, but, but really, th th this is the cool part, but, but, but it's really the, the maturation, it's, it's the culturing, it's, 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 it's the, the little things, uh, the details that actually really are what adds up, and in my opinion, um, are, are, are what makes or breaks in an IVF lab. So Yeah, so you talk about that secret source, really, of actually, mm -hmm. so how difficult is that? Is that something that this information is readily available off the shelf, or is there a lot of sort of local knowledge and um, iterative change, um, trial and error? Uh, a, a little bit of, of both, I guess. Um, I, I will say, at least in the equine world, there, there does seem to be um, a little bit of, of secret sauce or... Um, uh, people don't like to divulge information maybe as, as, as much as, as, as one would hope or as, 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 as they had maybe with some other procedures like true embryo transfer or even with um, uh, collecting oocytes. You know, we've been actually collecting oocytes or doing that TVA procedure for, for five years. It's this ICSI, you know, we've only been involved for, for a, a year doing it. Um, so, but, you know, shout out to CSU. I, I, I got to, to go there and train in the, in the winter of 2019 um, for a couple weeks and, and, and they helped me a lot um, uh, getting, getting my feet wet uh, and also answering any questions that I could have. Um, but really the past, past year has been just a lot of reading, uh, a lot of studying, um, you know, sending out emails that, that, that you usually go unanswered or, you know, stuff like that. Um, just it's, uh, people just don't like to divulge some of this information. Um, but I understand why to a point. Um, but I can tell you, we ain't going to be that way. <laughs> so you've um, got this uh, procedure down. So once you've actually got the, the sperm in there, right, and you've looked to sort of see mm -hmm. that things are progressing well, so what are your options then? I mean, again, this is an emotionally charged situation. All of a sudden, I had this healthy man now. I've actually just harvested genetics. And I've got to do something. Mm -hmm. So what forks in the road are there? We have these viable embryos go through the process of how do people make decisions on what to do and how do we actually preserve those for a later date? Now, you mentioned freezing, so talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Well, uh, you know, prior to get to freezing and, and after the injection process, you have a, you know, this, this, this window of time that you're hoping for a progressive development. Um, and so, but, but about 10 days after you perform the injection, you know, you should really know, am I going to, am I going to have a, a viable embryo? Um, and what I mean by viable is um, that, that image, that far image on, on the right there, that day eight blastocyst, that's, that's what I would consider a, a good quality embryo. Um, these are what we, we, we like to grow in the lab. Um, and at that point, you can then, um, you know, discuss with the owner, would you like to transfer this, you know, into a mare, or we have the option to freeze, uh, or vitrify is what we currently use, and uh, we won't get into the details there. Um, but at least in our laboratory, um, 
studies have shown over the past two years, we have no, we don't have a difference in transfer rates in ICSI embryos between fresh and vitrified thawed. So um, that's 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 good to know. Mm-hmm. And in human medicine, um, vitrified embryos, it's become the standard of care. You have to realize a lot of these women go through stimulation procedures. Um, you know, they get they get issues with the endometrium and that type of thing. So this, by allowing us to freeze the embryos for them, it allows the uterus to cool down for us. It allows us a recipient, a recipient or surrogate mare uh, to synchronize at the right cr- or proper time to, to allow us to transfer an embryo. Or even, even having the fullest time of year you want them, right? Exactly. So you, could, you can do this procedure whenever you want and then, mm-hmm. then transfer them at a later time. Yep, or a year later, two years later. Yeah. Um, if you have an old mare that you're worried about from a health standpoint, some mm-hmm. people will start banking as many embryos as they can. Mm. Is there any special handling, like people may have gone through an embryo transfer procedure before, is there any special handling with the, the XC embryos compared to any other fertilized um, well, they're, they're very delicate um, structures. We, we try to be very clean. Um, you know, we, we handle most of these um, uh, embryos either in a, and the materials that we use either in a biosafety cab- cabinet or laminar flow hood. Um, so, uh, we, you know, we, all the, the items that we purchase for handling embryos, we make sure they're MEA, mouse embryo assay tested. Um, so there, there are precautions that we take. Um, but in terms of or getting back to, um, you know, freezing and thawing, you know, we act, they actually seem to tolerate that process pretty darn good. Mm-hmm. So um, the one thing we you need to re- realize about um, equine ICSI embryos is they look a lot different than embryos that we would produce inside the mare or, or in vivo. Um, and they oftentimes will take a little bit longer time to develop inside the mare. As a result, after we transfer, we usually wait about a week to do our first pregnancy check, mm. um, as opposed to maybe four, four or five days later. Yeah, because you're mentioning about, you know, the, the thick, you know, the zoner and everything, mm-hmm. like actually puncturing that with the, the micro pipette, whether that actually has any downstream effects. Oh, yeah. No, that's a great question. And um, and that, that reminds me about the actually two different types of ICSI that you can perform in, in horses. Uh, the one that, that, that I gave an example of back here is uh, shown here is the conventional ICSI. That's when a um, very sharp glass needle is, is used um, to, to, to perform the puncture. Uh, the other method is a piezo, using a piezo drill. Um, there's been some studies that have shown that the piezo drill uh, may have a little bit higher blast assist rates, um, but it's actually become a little bit of um, a user, user preference. Um, we utilize both techniques, um, and at least right now in our hands, the conventional method seems to work a little bit better. So, um, but that's not to say we're not giving up on the piezo drill. And there are certain instances where we, we like the piezo drill. Um, it's, uh, it's just, uh, I think that um, you developing a, 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 a preference for one technique the, over the other um, is really what it's amounted to. So um, downstream, once you've actually impr- implanted these embryos and uh, pregnancy has been established, any um, differences in success rates with establishment of pregnancy, development through pregnancy, or the foals that result from this technique? Any health issues that could be um, ascribed to this technique as opposed to um, what came naturally? Yeah, that's another great question. Uh, well, first off, pregnancy rates aren't as, aren't as high. Um, so if we transfer an embry- uh, ICSI embryo, we're looking at about 60-65% chance of that of forming a pregnancy, when we transfer a natural embryo, you're looking at over 80%. Um, and then there is pregnancy wastage that occurs or early embryonic death. Um, most likely, uh, at least in, in, our, in, in our herd, um, it's gonna occur before 42 days um, of gestation. And that's why we like to hold on to our, our recipients until that time. Um, the other issue that, that we run into is, is uh, monozygotic twins. Uh, around day 25 to 28, uh, the embryo decides to, to split on its own and for some unknown reason. And as you can, that, that's problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's not unheard of, though. There's been reports in traditional embryo transfer yep. of this occurring. Had it happened. Yeah. <laughs> and I believe there was a report at the SFT meeting just this year of it occurring in a thoroughbred mare, which is a little scary, um, to be honest with you. Um, so, uh, but, uh, unfortunately we don't have re- great methods of reducing monozygotic twins to a singleton pregnancy. And usually those, pre- usually I say most of the time, those are, those are aborted. Mm-hmm. 
But people shouldn't be disappointed by the low results because essentially in a lot of situations, this is a salvage procedure. Yes, sir. You know, like you've lost the mare, you know, you're basically um, at the end of the road from the male side of it. And so mm. you're trying to make something out of nothing. And so while those numbers are less, I mean, you've still got more of a chance than zero. Exactly. Now, is so is this more of a salvage procedure? Are you, are you seeing it more with, with performance horses? Well, as I think I indicated earlier, we're starting to see it swing more towards more performance horses. Um, you know, in, in the past, we used to treat a lot of um, mares for possible oviduct obstructions. Yeah. Because this technique mm -hmm. bypasses basically the entire reproductive tract, except for the ovaries, um, it's a lot easier just to say, well, let's go ahead and do ICSI, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, tr you know, doing all these treatments to her cervix or uterus or what have you. Yeah. So that's the point so, I was trying to make. Yeah. I mean, you can get a pregnancy, like for the, some of the mares Charlie's describing, there's no way other than, as you say, you bypass yep, the entire sure. reproductive tract, you don't rely on this embryo having a happy uterus to drop mm -hmm. into before you flush it. You can just cut all of that out and get something out of a mare you otherwise couldn't have got. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I think that's, I think that's the appeal for it. Yeah. There's, there's two different groups, right? There's, there's, there's the group where th we can't get a pregnancy any other way mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. doing this. And then there's the other group where, go, well, I, I've got this mare who's performing, and yeah. th this is the easiest, simplest way to do this. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's <coughs> definitely, definitely true. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it, it's a salvage procedure in some cases, mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, it's become more and more of a viable method, I think, um, to generate pregnancies, um, just almost, I, w I w don't want to say routinely. Um, but I, I don't, I also the, the this procedure has maybe gotten knocked a little bit for expense. And, and I think that, um, the reason why is is because we exhaust so many of our options before we used to get to this procedure, and the owner has this perception that they spent a lot of money, and then they get to ICSI, and then it's even more money. Well, again, if we can cut out some of those middle steps, like having to flush her oviducts mm -hmm. or, or spend a lot of money treating her uterus, um, this, this procedure actually ends up being fairly affordable, um, to be honest with you. And if you have a young mare with nice oocytes and, a, and good quality semen, um, shoot, you might, one transvaginal aspiration might yield you two or three uh, embryos and um, you're done with her for the rest of the season. You know, just in that, that one time, she can go yeah. on and, 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 and perform for the rest yeah. of the, the year. Yeah, that's the thing, like, to keep, like, these mares, like, with minimal manipulation, really, they can actually just go ahead and keep showing, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, they've um, got all of these progeny. So, yep. you're, you're right. I mean, in that situation, this is actually definitely a, a potential for a great money spinner for the uh, people that own the genetics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. And, again, we mentioned, you know, how some – People utilize this just because it's the only way they can get semen from a particular stallion. And you'll maybe see people start, or not maybe, but you are seeing people doing this um, for mares as well, or specific genetic combinations. Mm. So when you look on down the road, though, um, the, the really interesting thing to me about this technique is because we're following embryonic development along, um, you know, we, we get a real appreciation for how good mother nature is and, mm -hmm. and also a true respect um, for, for what she can do. Um, it's also quite humbling at times. Um, but, you know, I do foresee a future where um, we we're biopsying these embryos and, and prior to implanting them, we're telling the owners it's going to be this sex, it's going to have this color, it's going to have this particular gene, it's going to be susceptible to this disease but resistant to this one. Um, I, I think that that's, that's coming on down the road here. And um, I, th I think that's what's really exciting. That pre-implantation genetics, that's what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, see, I see where um, people could latch onto that in the future. Yeah, again, like I say, preservation of um, genetics, right? But also you're looking outside preservation of species. Mm -hmm. If you actually look at this globally, I mean, potentially, okay, we're talking about horses, but getting this technique down, there may be other equids. Yes. Right, and you have a skill set in equids, and all of a sudden there may be some rare horse that, hey, we need to preserve this particular type of equid, mm -hmm. and um, you might be the man to come and see. Yeah, you know, <laughs> since that Cincinnati Zoo is just right up the interstate. And, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd go to the zoo, but they wouldn't let me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's true. <laughs> Excellent. So.
Well, Charlie, this has been fascinating. Um, it's really good to know, you know what's going on down there. And there is so much that goes into this. I mean, actually, it's such an easy thing to say and it rolls off the tongue, but there's so many steps and there's so many foundation things and other assisted reproductive technologies that this can be like the crowning thing for to actually say hey, we can get these... Um, and we can get these embryos generated really in situations that we shouldn't rightly be able to get these embryos generated and then we can go ahead and have a successful pregnancy and we can store them and so this is just fascinating stuff well we, we've packaged this in a in a neat little 20 minute conversation but um it's, it's fairly complicated this is a this is a really complicated advanced technique that there's only yeah. a handful of people in the world can can do and so and, and that, that said there's lots of things on the horizon that, that can be done and some advancements and we're, we're early is my point. Yes, yeah. I, I, exactly. <coughs> um, and I hope I, even ex- as excited as I get about this, I would not consider myself an expert by, by any means. There's, there's other people out there who are doing this technique um, in a much higher volume um, th- than we are, who I, I have the utmost respect for. And, um, but, but the, and they've set the bar really high. Um, but it's just my nature and my attitude to go after them. Um, and, and, and hopefully one day we're going to be the one setting that bar. Um, and I think if we continue to, to stick with it um, and work hard, um, uh, you know, we will be setting that bar a lot sooner than we thought we would. Yeah. Well, that, that light in that lab is burning late at night. I know Charlie's. <laughs> I drive by there. I see Charlie in there all yeah. the time. Seriously. Got to go home at some point, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's funny you say that. My wife actually helps out a little bit in the, in the lab, at least early on. She, she is a laboratory director over at the Gluck Center, and she has some uh, actually quite a um, a decent background on tissue culture. Mm. Um, so she's been useful as far as what type of pipettes to order and all that stuff. Oh, nice. So um, it takes a village, y'all. Yeah. It takes a village. Yeah, well, there you go. So you had a <laughs> wife who didn't really know. He had like an inbuilt uh, <laughs> library of information for the next step in your career. Yeah. That's great. Well, Charlie, thanks for coming on the show and uh, telling us all about what you're doing. Uh, we're very impressed. All right. Well, thank yeah. you all for having nice. me. Thanks fun. for being here. Well, that was stall side for this week. We've been talking to Dr. Charlie Scoggin about uh, XC and other assisted reproductive technologies in horses. See you next time. <laughs>